So I want to start out by saying thank you for having me today. Uh, it's great to be back in Ithaca. I'm a 96 grad and um, been back once before for a reunion, but this was, it was wonderful to kind of drive around Ithaca, so thank you. Um, I also want to preface this by saying that I'm a cardiologist, not a shelter veterinarian, which is obvious, but so I want to go over um, the approach to cases that have a cardiac aspect um, and uh, I would welcome your dialogue, your questions as far as how that pertains to particular shelter settings, but um, I've tried to kind of tailor things that way, but um, please chime in if you have a comment or a question. So some of the things that I want to talk about today are our goals, and our goals in, in any cardiology setting, whether it's a private referral practice or a general practice or a shelter setting, are probably relatively similar. Um, I want to touch on the prevalence of um, cardiac disease because I think that probably is relevant to what would be seen in a shelter setting. And just as a quick definition, um, I, I like this cartoon because it illustrates the difference between prevalence and incidence. So prevalence is a one-time uh, picture of how common the disease is in a particular population that, that's sampled. And so it's going to take into account the incidence which of new cases, the recurrence of cases, and then cases that are lost to mortality, as opposed to incidence, which is the um, new cases that happen over time. So most of the studies that we're going to look at are prevalence type studies. Um, I want to talk about clinical profiling to get to a diagnosis of uh, cardiac disease and what tools we have other than physical examination, although we'll heavily look at that uh, for making our diagnosis uh, that, that can lead us to our treatment options and prognostication. Um, we'll touch briefly as much as you'd like on anesthetic considerations using a couple case examples and some specific diseases. So our goals are probably similar whether you're in a referral setting or a shelter setting or a GP setting, like I said. We want to be able to accurately identify those patients that have heart disease so we can take that, now, that information and arm ourselves with the knowledge about the case so then we can have the action to decide how to best treat that patient and how to prognosticate um, for um, the future of that dog or cat in particular. So the first thing I want to do is go over some of the prevalence studies that are out there. Um, and there are a number of them relatively recently. This was a study of nearly 1,000 dogs um, in 2011 from Italy. This was a referral practice, so um, a referral setting. And they had um, about 4,500 dogs. 22% um, of that population had congenital heart disease, and this is what we'll kind of talk about first. And 15% of those dogs had more than one defect. Now that's a pretty high percentage compared to some other populations, but this is a referral-based um, hospital. Um, some of the common diseases that we expect, uh, pulmonic stenosis, SAS, PDA, VSD, tricuspid dysplasia were seen in that population. And as you might expect, purebreds were overrepresented compared to mixed breed dogs, with boxers and shepherds being commonly represented. This is another study um, out of JVC just two years ago that looked at congenital heart disease in cats, and they had um, a quite a large number of cats in this referral, again, population at a referral hospital. They had about 33,000 cats they looked at. Um, only a very small percent, 0.3 percent, had congenital heart disease, and this was about 8 percent of the total cats with heart disease in that study. Um, and again, the most common um, defects were VSD, pulmonic stenosis, ASD, aortic stenosis, those sorts of diseases as well. So apparently a much uh, smaller percentage of congenital heart disease in cats than dogs compared to these two referral population studies. Now this is a nice study that I think does have relevance. This was um, over a six-year period at a no-kill shelter with an extremely high number of dogs and cats that were screened by Dr. Schroep. And what he found um, was that in the dogs, there was a relatively low um, percentage um, of prevalence of congenital heart disease in those dogs and a similar prevalence of innocent murmurs in those dogs. So that's kind of interesting too. And the distribution of congenital heart disease was as we might expect with the common ones being most represented, pulmonic stenosis, PDA, SAS, and VSD. Um, in the cats, he found a similar prevalence of congenital heart disease uh, in this population of cats as well, um, and maybe a higher percentage of cats with innocent murmurs as well. Let me show you that. 
So in uh, this uh, circle graph here, pie chart, we can see that there's a more even distribution of the congenital heart diseases that he found compared to the dogs, which are heavily weighted for PSAS and PDA. There was a smattering of things, certainly VSD, pulmonic stenosis, and uh, and um, subaortic stenosis were in there, but there were some other weird things as well that we sometimes see in cats, such as tetralogy of flow and um, uh, ASDs and mitral valve dysplasias and things like that. So pretty low prevalence of congenital heart disease, but this paper I want to point out, this was a paper that looked at um, nearly 800 cats in a shelter setting, and they were looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in these cats. And they also did look at congenital heart disease too, but what they found in this study was um, similar to other studies um, in the general cat population in that a lot of cats have heart murmurs. A lot of those murmurs are functional or innocent heart murmurs and don't indicate heart disease, but a decent percentage, nearly 15%, had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in that study. And they weren't, as we'll, we'll touch on later and what we see clinically, the cats with murmurs are not necessarily the cats that had cardiomyopathy and vice versa, so making it a little bit difficult to interpret murmurs in cats, especially when so many of them have functional heart murmurs. And in this study, they had a half percent that had congenital heart disease. Now this study looked at a little bit more of um, incidents over time, and I know this is small, I tried to make it as big as possible, but this, these are our pie charts looking at cats from different age groups, from six to 12 months all the way up to a senior, which was defined as greater than nine years. And what you can appreciate anyway is that this white section here is um, no murmur and no HCM, and the gray section is murmur and no HCM, and the pink section is murmur with HCM. And as the cats got older over time, this is not working that well, we can see that the white uh, section gets smaller, so the no HCM, no murmur gets smaller as cats get older. The um, gray section, which is murmur, no HCM, so presumably functional murmur, gets bigger as cats get older, and also the pink section of murmur and HCM, or murmur, no murmur and HCM, gets larger with age. So the incidence of HCM and the incidence of functional murmurs appears to increase with age in cats, at least in the shelter study. Dilated cardiomyopathy, um, there have been a couple studies that have looked at it, and I think you need to interpret these studies based on what population of dogs they're looking at. So um, this was from the proposed guidelines for the diagnosis of DCM in dogs from 2003, so a while ago, but they cite um, using the veterinary medical database at Purdue University with a very large number of dogs that there was about half percent of those dogs that had dilated cardiomyopathy. And that percent was different whether you are purebred at 0.65 or whether you are a mixed breed at 0.16% uh, percent incidence of di uh, prevalence of DCM. So uh, similar to maybe congenital heart disease as far as the just a cross section of dogs, um, if they looked at Dobermans and other high risk breeds specifically, then the percentage was much higher and it approached 6%. So if you targeted in on those breeds that we know are predisposed to cardiomyopathy, we got a higher percentage. And then if we take that in conjunction with some other studies that have pu been published based on actual intentional breed screens of Dobermans and Wolfhounds and Greyhound or, uh, Great Danes and those sorts of breeds that we know are at risk, then the prevalence is quite high. And so most of the studies that have looked at Dobermans specifically have reported a uh, prevalence of six, 50 to 60 percent in the Doberman breed, um, lower but still significant percentages in the Wolfhounds. Um, and the Newfoundlands and, Gre and Great Danes as well. So if we're targeting a specific breed, the prevalence can be quite high, but um, that would probably be more relevant to a referral setting where patients are being referred for that purpose or screened for that purpose. This is a study um, also that shows that the incidence of DCM, at least in the Doberman breed, increases with age. Um, as we know clinically, but this was a nice study to show it, the green area here are uh, Dobermans that are healthy, and the um, colored areas are varying degrees of the ways to diagnose DCM, either by arrhythmias or uh, poor function or both. And the incidence of disease goes up as the dogs get older, with this group here being greater, greater than eight years of age, and very few dogs being diagnosed at one to two years of age. So our index of suspicion for the disease needs to go up as the age of the patient presenting to us uh, increases as well. <coughs> 
Degenerative mitral valve disease is extremely prevalent, as we all know. Um, this was a study from um, 2015 in JVIM where it looked at 111,000 dogs and the prevalence of mitral valve disease was estimated to be about 3.5 percent and that was not based on imaging necessarily, it was based on some dogs had imaging and some had a classic murmur. Um, so cross-section of all dogs and all ages, um, that doesn't seem like particularly high for a prevalence. But we know that there's a couple other studies out there that look at um, specific, you know, small breed dogs, specifically Cavaliers and some other breeds, as they age, and they have found, those studies have found that the prevalence and the incidence actually approaches 100% as dogs approach 10 years of age. So nearly all dogs of small breeds that are at risk will develop some degree of a mitral valve degenerative disease. But they don't all die from it, and some studies have suggested that maybe 25 to 30 percent of those dogs will go on to progress to congestive heart failure, um, and that's, you know, that's the minority. So many dogs are affected, but um, not all dogs will go on to develop clinical signs of disease. So it is important for us to be able to not only identify those diseases, but also decide which patients might need treatment or might have a worse prognosis than other patients. And this is a similar type study to the last graph I showed you. This was from a long time ago, 1967. It was a pathology study, and it looked at the incidence of pathologic mitral valve lesions in dogs as they got older. So these 0 to 4 um, years of age up to 13 to 16 years of age, and the white is a normal mitral valve at postmortem, and the uh, black is severely affected, and then the shades of gray are mild to moderately affected. So we can appreciate that as you approach uh, 9 or 10 years of age, almost no dogs have completely normal valves. So um, this probably should not surprise us when we're having older dogs that have mitral valve murmurs and we need to do something additional to decide if it's clinically important to the, to the patient. So I want to touch on heartworm disease as well. Um, and I know we're maybe in an area of the country that doesn't have a as much heartworm disease as my area of the country down in North Carolina. <laughs> but um, this is an echo, just to orient you, of uh, a kitty cat with aorta in the center. This is pulmonary artery, and you can see these heartworm echoes here in the main pulmonary artery um, and right ventricular outflow tract. So obviously the, the incidence of heartworm disease is going to vary depending on the region of the country, but I think we're all, we all know that we're all touched by it because of movement of dogs and uh, climate in particular. So a couple studies, these are two studies for cats that we'll focus on on this slide. Um, from a little while ago, 2000 and 1988, um, one study was based out of Michigan and the other out of Alabama. And these were post-mortem studies and they, so they made their diagnosis based on finding worms in the heart at post-mortem. Um, they did not attempt to identify juvenile stages or serology in these studies. And um, even though it was Michigan versus Alabama, the percent of 2.5 to 2.8 percent of cats had uh, heartworms on necropsy um, gives you an idea that this disease is certainly out there. Um, this was a study from a little bit more recently um, out of Florida. This is 2003 in Jaha. And they had 630 cats that were euthanized at a shelter. And they had maybe a little bit higher incidence of uh, prevalence of heartworm in infection based on uh, finding worms in the heart, anywhere from one to four worms. And they had, it was close to 5%. Uh, but they also did serology on these cats, and they had a much higher um, percent of cats that were antibody positive. So this probably speaks to exposure and uh, non-patent infections in those cats. Um, and the, conversely, the other way is that t nearly 30% of the cats where they found heartworms had a negative antigen. Um, so this speaks to us needing to do antigen antibody testing and maybe some other testing if we're going to accurately diagnose all the cats that we, that we can with heartworm disease. Um, and from this study, they also looked at other infectious diseases, feline leukemia, FIV, and found that um, the percentage of cats that had heartworm disease was the same or a little bit higher than FIV, FELV infected cats, and that males were uh, more likely to be infected than females in this study. This was a study that Dr. Levy's group um, just published in April of this year, um, and this was a large seroprevalence study. And in this study, they looked at um, 
uh, SNAP kits for um, cats all over the country, and they had um, about 1,300 veterinary clinics and 120 animal shelters that participated in this study, and they found that there was an overall percent prevalence in this study of heartworm dis disease in cats based on serology of 0.4%. Um, but that varied a lot, and down in my area of the country, it was up near 1.6%, um, but overall it was 0.3, and you can see the distribution on this map. Um, so definitely out there, even in some areas that maybe you wouldn't expect it. So heartworm disease in dogs, um, we know it's higher, it's got a higher prevalence than in cats, maybe, um, you know, depending on the study that you look at, um, twice as higher, a little bit higher. But these are, these are some pretty old studies that looked at prevalence based on pathology, and they were five, basically 5 to 10 percent um, of dogs in a shelter setting um, in Ohio and in Missouri had heartworm um, disease. Um, and this is another paper that just came out in 2016 from Dr. Bowman that kind of looked at trying to forecast the, the occurrence of heartworm disease in the future based on past um, tests that have been reported, and based on this, um, the overall U.S. seroprevalence is expected to be about 1.2 percent, but certainly very regional, like that last map showed, in some areas in the southeast, still up to 13 percent. This is a, um, a, uh, a study, a survey anyway, that was done a few years ago from the, uh, Ameri between the American Heartworm Society and the American uh, Society of Shelter Veterinarians. And I thought this would just provide a little bit of food for thought um, in that we have, um, there were about 105 shelter veterinarians that were surveyed for this, um, this report. And one of the questions, there were many questions in this survey, but one of the ones I picked out of there was, do you test cats in, for heartworm disease and do you test dogs for heartworm disease? And you can see that the vast majority of shelter veterinarians reported they did not test cats for heartworm disease, um, but 6% of those um, shelters um, said sometimes, and that was mainly influenced by whether those cats had clinical signs that could be um, supportive of heartworm disease. Um, about half of them said, yes, all dogs are tested, um, and another close to half said, some dogs are tested. And the ones that said some dogs are tested were influenced heavily by the presence of clinical signs, what kind of shelter it was, the age of the animal, whether there's evidence of previous ownership, or whether the adopted um, uh, party might consider paying for it. So, um, and whether they were in, from endemic areas also influenced that decision. So summary for um, how much heart disease is out there that we might see in cats for congenital heart disease, depending on which study we look at, anywhere from 0.14 to a half percent of cats um, just cross-sectionally have um, some form of congenital heart disease. Nearly 15 percent in several studies, and specifically that one shelter study, have evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which might impact our decisions um, in how the cat does long term. And anywhere from a half to five percent of cats have heartworm disease, depending on whether it's a seroprevalence study or a pathology study. So while these percentages, maybe some of them are not super high, I think that we do have um, the uh, need to be on the lookout for some of these diseases out there, some more than the other, more than others. For dogs, a similarly low percent of dogs have congenital heart disease, according to some very, very large studies. Um, about half percent, I think we could say, have DCM and maybe higher if we're uh, zoning in on certain breeds. Um, and then for mitral regurgitation, if we just want to take a cross-section, maybe the percentage, actually this should say 3.5 percent, I'm sorry, um, up to 100 percent if we're talking about older animals that are a small breed and at risk for mitral regurgitation. So there's definitely an age and breed effect there. And then um, a variable um, percent of dogs could be affected with heartworm disease, depending on what area of the country we're in. <coughs> so it would be great if it was as easy to find patients with heart disease as it was to find this, um, this black sheep in the crowd of white ones, but we have to do some other diagnostics usually. And what I want to kind of talk a little bit about is patient profiling and using our physical exam skills and when we go the next step to determine testing, which might quite honestly vary according to the setting and the uh, shelter that, um, that everyone is in as far as the access to diagnostics or what, what's able to be done for patients. So patient profiling in human medicine is defined as the practice of regarding particular patients as more or, like, more or less likely to have certain behaviors or illnesses based on their appearance, 
their race, their gender, financial status, or other observable characteristics. So in human medicine, patient profiling is actually not a good thing. <laughs> and the, according to Dr. Google, there's plenty of lawyers that are um, willing to help you out if you think you've been patient profiled. So I would contend that that is um, a good thing in veterinary medicine and that we do it whether we do it consciously or subconsciously. We look at the gender of the, the dog, we look at the species, we look at the breed, we look at the size of the dog, and we come up with a clinical suspicion to help guide us one way or another for our tests or our differential diagnosis list. So I think that patient profiling is a good thing in veterinary medicine. But. So after we've gone through assessing what our patient might be most at risk, fact, at risk for, because it is, for instance, in this last one, maybe we've got a young boxer and with a loud murmur. We might be patient profiling that one down the road of maybe the dog has a subaortic stenosis. Or maybe we look at this young chihuahua with a loud continuous murmur and we say, I think that's probably most likely going to be a PDA. So after we um, look at our patient from afar, then we want to go ahead and do the next step, which is physical examination. And we can get a lot from physical examination, um, maybe more than we sometimes think about. So I want to spend a little bit more time on that um, before we kind of delve into the diagnostics. Um, in these, all these techniques, you know, we, we have more and more exposure to advanced diagnostic techniques, but we really can end up going down the wrong, the wrong path if we're not spending the time um, doing a good, uh, solid physical examination. So we've got history, so in some cases, and physical exam um, as tools that are right there and don't cost us anything. Um, history may or may not be available, depending on what we know about the patient um, in the shelter. Um, but if there's some sort of, for example, history of regurgitation after weaning, then that might make us think more of a vascular ring anomaly. Um, so we can use what we have to try to sort of guide us. Um, but our physical examination, um, you know, common sense. Many patients with congenital heart disease or asymptomatic heart disease can look externally good, but a, a puppy that's not growing well, as well as its litter mates, or looks unthrifty with a loud heart murmur, you know, certainly the general status can lead us one way or the other as far as severity of, the, of what we think we're dealing with. Um, our mucous membrane color, are they pink or are they pale or are they cyanotic, might lead us to the diagnosis of congenital heart disease or decompensated acquired disease. Um, we'll spend the next couple slides looking at murmur, at grade, and location because I think that is important too. Um, the presence of a gallop in cats I think can be really useful. You know, murmurs, we, just, we touched on that a lot of murmurs um, are functional in cats and so hearing a heart murmur in a cat does not mean that, heart has, that cat has heart disease and vice versa, but a gallop is more specific. So if we're hearing a gallop in a cat, that doesn't usually happen as an innocent finding, and that usually indicates some degree of heart disease. So I think that is an important physical exam pickup. Question. Yeah. I don't know what you mean when you say functional heart murmur. We use that term um, synonymously with innocent. So sorry about that. So innocent, functional, physiologic tend to be interchanged. And or, yeah, or pathologic, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some people will kind of separate out innocent from functional slash physiologic, meaning that if you've got anemia or high cardiac output or something like that that it could, could explain your murmur, then that's probably not truly innocent. It's physiologic or functional. Whereas if you do, if you echo a cat and it's got a murmur, there's no heart disease, it's not hyperthyroid, it's not, you have no explanation, then, then innocent's probably the correct term, but they get interchanged a lot. Thank you for clarifying. Heart rate and rhythm are important. Um, respiratory rate and lung sound, certainly if we're worried about a patient that might be clinical for its heart disease. Um, and femoral, uh, femoral artery, <laughs> femoral pulse quality can help us decide to go down one path or another. For instance, if femoral pulse quality is uh, really poor and difficult to, difficult to actually feel the pulses in a young patient, we may be thinking, gosh, this is probably more SAS with this left basal murmur as opposed to pulmonic stenosis. Or if we've got you know, really bounding pulses, um, maybe that patient has a PDA, especially if it has a murmur that fits with it. So pulse quality can certainly help us. And then I think we often forget about uh, the view into right heart pressures looking at jugular pulses and abdominal palpation. So really that jugular pulse and how far it goes up the neck 
um, can really give us the view into right atrial pressures and what uh, CVP might be. So that's something that, you know, in this Greyhound, yeah, it's pretty easy to look at the Greyhound. In a big fluffy Newfoundland, you probably have to shave them and that takes a little bit extra, extra time. So, um, you know, we, I think we do tend to skip that, but it can be an important diagnostic tool for us. So let's focus on, on systolic murmurs. There are very few things that cause uh, diastolic murmurs alone that we might pick up on, and those might be aortic insufficiency or pulmonary insufficiency. But the vast majority of the murmurs that we hear are going to be systolic, and so that's what we will talk about with one exception. So I, you can certainly separate out the left base at this pulmonic region here down near the sternum and then up a little bit higher at the aortic region. But I have to admit that clinically, I lump the two together and I say it's a left basal or systolic murmur or it's a left apical if I'm moving back toward the, toward the um, elbow in the, on the chest, qual on chest area. So up at the left base, the things that we want to think about up near the pulmonic area, pulmonic stenosis, uh, congenital pulmonic stenosis will give us a loud left basal or systolic murmur. Um, there are a few other things up at that area though too. So subaortic stenosis often produces its murmur loudest at the left base. And this is where we hear physiologic murmurs and the soft murmur of atrial septal defects as well. So they can be sometimes di very difficult to distinguish those on physical examination. Um, we can comment that physiologic murmurs usually are not loud. Um, and subaortic stenosis might have poor pulses, whereas pulmonic stenosis would not be expected to. So we can use other aspects of our physical to kind of separate those out clinically. PDA is not just systolic, it's a continuous washing machine-like murmur. And one comment I would make about this is that it w it's even more cranial than the base. So really shoving your stethoscope up into the armpit of these young puppies and kittens is going to be important um, because sometimes the PDA murmur doesn't radiate and so it might not uh, disseminate toward the more common areas to listen to. So, and that would be a continuous murmur and that's really the only one on the slide that's not going to be a pure systolic murmur. So these are the things we think about up at the base. If we move back a little bit more caudally over the apex, that's really going to be over the mitral valve and that's where we hear mitral regurgitation. And so then we want to kind of step back and say what things can cause mitral regurgitation. And if it's a really young patient, we might think about mitral dysplasia. Any other patient, the top five differentials from that point are probably going to be degenerative mitral valve disease. And then um, after that, we might consider functional mitral uh, regurgitation from DCM, so just a little secondary MR, or endocarditis um, from an infected valve. But those are going to be a bit less likely than degenerative valve disease. And then switching over to the right side, there are basically two things that we hear over on the right side. You'll hear the murmur of, the, of a ventricular septal defect shooting from the left side over to the right side across that defective septum. And then we'll also hear tricuspid regurgitation over on the right side. And that can be because of tricuspid dysplasia, so a young patient, we might have that higher on our list than an older patient. Um, an acquired tricuspid valve disease can happen uh, from degenerative valve disease or pulmonary hypertension or heartworm disease or something along those lines as well. So let's talk specifically about puppies and kittens because as we mentioned if, um, just a minute ago, they commonly have these innocent or functional or physiologic murmurs with age, and that's because their stroke volume is relatively greater than that of an adult animal, and their um, hematocrit is relatively lower than that of an adult uh, animal. And so both of those can contribute to a murmur that's not necessarily associated with heart disease. And we expect those murmurs to be soft, usually less than grade three, and we expect dogs to grow out, dogs and kittens to grow out of those murmurs by four to five months of age. So in this situation, we, um, you know, we both in the, maybe in the shelter setting as well as what we see in the referral setting might approach a soft murmur in an otherwise healthy animal um, by saying, let's see what happens with time. Let's see if, let's listen to this patient again at four to five months of age. And if there's a murmur there at that point, then we go ahead and we pursue more diagnostics and do an echocardiogram. Or if that patient isn't growing well or has something else going on that would suggest heart disease, we might pursue more uh, advanced diagnostics earlier. But there may be certain situations, maybe in my population more than yours, where we have a very uh, in-tune owner or a very nervous owner or breeder and they want to echo the patient um, before it has a chance to grow out of that murmur, and that's probably okay as well. 
um, we are sometimes put in that situation. But if everything fits for it being a puppy murmur or a kitten murmur, I think it's fine to wait uh, and see if it goes away. So in contrast, if the murmur is loud or there's clinical signs of heart disease present, um, or if it's a diastolic or continuous murmur in addition to systolic, that's usually not an innocent murmur. Um, if you hear it not just at the left base, but you hear it loudest at a different location, then that would suggest pathology as well. Um, and then there will be overlap between those. So we may think that everything fits with the physiologic murmur in this patient, but maybe they have mild subaortic stenosis and the murmur's not loud. So we can't say for sure that they don't have some form of mild heart disease, um, but there will be a little bit of overlap there, but at least we probably don't have severe disease. So murmurs in adult dogs, let's start with the small dog. The murmur of mitral regurgitation, again, is going to be at the left apex. It is usually not a diagnostic dilemma for us um, because most of the time it's a small breed dog that's older without clinical signs of being ill, and that's probably greater than 95% chance going to be due to degenerative mitral valve disease. So there may be situations where we don't necessarily feel the need to pursue an echocardiogram or maybe we just do chest x-rays or monitor that patient, and I think in many instances that is okay an okay approach. Um, but we can gain a little bit of information, even though the murmur is probably MR. There's roughly some correlation with the intensity of the murmur and the severity of the MR. Uh, it's not perfect, but you can see from this paper from 2014 that as the murmur grade increased, there was an increase in the size of the left atrium as, as indicated by the LA to AO ratio. Um, so I think that we can get a rough idea. You know, a patient with a grade two left apical systolic murmur probably doesn't have terrible uh, degenerative mitral valve disease. So if we move toward the large breed dog, um, dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy often have left apical systolic murmurs as well because the dilated heart stretches the mitral annulus and we create a little bit of leakage backward. And that usually is not going to be a loud murmur either. So if it's louder than a grade two to three, then it's probably not just a functional or not just a uh, little bit of functional mitral regurge causing a soft systolic mitral murmur there. But it's a little bit confusing too because some studies have shown that up to 25% of large breed dogs, even Dobermans, can have pure degenerative mitral valve disease. So it doesn't necessarily, we're not necessarily able to go by just the murmur. We also cannot say that it's a soft murmur, therefore it's not important in a Doberman or other large breed dog because maybe they have terrible DCM and just a little bit of regurge. So I think that there's maybe more of a push to uh, perform diagnostic imaging in a large breed dog with a mitral murmur as opposed to a small breed dog. And then heartworm disease, depending on the severity of heartworm disease, we may have no cardiac abnormalities as well, as, as at all on physical examination, or we might have a right-sided murmur of tricuspid regurgitation or because of pulmonary hypertension, depending on how severe um, that patient is affected. So cats, just to go back to how cat murmurs can uh, particularly not be as helpful as we would like them to be. Um, so many, many cats have um, murmurs that are not indicative of heart disease, and many cats with heart disease don't have murmurs. And these are some examples of studies. So in this study, uh, or in several studies anyway, uh, cats with heart disease just cross-sectionally in asymptomatic populations. There were 16% in one of the studies, up to 77% in another study of cats that had echocardiographic abnormalities suggestive of cardiomyopathy. Um, in the cats with murmurs, only 16 to 44% of cats with murmurs actually had heart disease. So there's clear overlap, and murmurs don't always tell us the whole story. But if we have a gallop or an arrhythmia or something else that's on our physical exam, that may lead us more toward thinking that that murmur is actually indicative of pathology. I will point out, too, that physiologic or functional or innocent heart murmurs in cats um, a lot of times are right-sided because we have uh, some dynamic obstruction of the right side. You may have heard the terms dynamic right ventricular alpha tract obstruction, or some people call it Dr. Voto because it's a lot easier to say. Um, but that can basically is where the right heart is squishing down on the left heart because of the high sympathetic state of a cat and creating a functional heart murmur. So that's a common cause of physiologic murmurs, but we also think of um, anemias and hyperthyroidism and things like that. And obviously there's overlap. So once we've done our physical exam and we've, we've profiled the patient and we've used our physical exam to uh, really refine our differential diagnosis list, then our next step um, is to decide what to do about it diagnostically. And so 
I assume that there will be different um, situations where um, other aspects of the case or the shelter situation might dictate what patients uh, get more diagnostics um, and which ones uh, don't. But I'm going to just assume that we have some ability to think about these things anyway for most of the patients. So once we've um, made our, we, once we have our clinical suspicion, then we might in some cases move on to blood work, including PCV and BNP testing. Uh, we might take radiographs or do an ECG or an echocardiogram. So we'll look at some of these tools individually. So PCV might be used to assess for anemia or polycythemia, which might lead us to the cause of a murmur or the presence of congenital heart disease. Um, NT Pro BNP um, has been coming out as a very useful indicator of um, the presence of cardiac stretch, which can lead us toward the presence of heart disease and may have some um, direct relationship to the severity of heart disease and the likelihood of patients having heart failure with respiratory distress or airway disease. So just, I'm just going to touch on a few things briefly. So studies in small breed dogs with murmurs, so the patients that are likely to have mitral valve disease. Um, a, NT pro BNP greater than 900 means that heart disease is likely. And it doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot about the severity. There is a gray zone of 900 to 1800 where patients can have um, pretty normal hearts and have that. And we know that the biological variability of BNP is quite high, so from day to day it can change. So we, we take this as a piece of the puzzle and not as um, the gold standard. Um, studies in cats with murmurs, 100 has been used as the cutoff for deciding whether heart disease is likely in that cat. So I think this can be useful in many different settings if we kind of, the, one of the values is a negative BNP, so a BNP less than 100 really does seem to strongly correlate with the um, absence of significant heart disease, so I think that can be useful. Cats that have um, higher BNPs, sometimes we see those with not a whole lot of heart disease, so maybe that's a little bit less useful than a negative BNP. And then as you know, this, there is a SNAP test available, and what the SNAP does is it gives us a negative if the BNP is less than 100, and a positive suggests that the BNP is greater than 270. So this could be useful in a respiratory distress cat where we're trying to decide is it airway disease or is it heart failure. If it's SNAP positive, it's probably greater than 270 and it's prob probably heart failure. But could there be a cat with significant heart disease and airway disease? Yes, that's certainly possible too. And we have to remember that between 100 and 270 in the study that looked at it, two-thirds of those cats had a, a negative BNP and one-third were positive. So it's not, we can certainly have some overlap, but what we can say is that a negative BNP is probably going to be less than 100, which is useful, I think, clinically. So we might use a BNP in conjunction with radiographs in a cat with a heart murmur. For instance, this little kitty here, uh, Sage, we took some radiographs on her and we can appreciate that she does look like she's got some cardiomegaly, she's got some left auricular enlargement, but there's no evidence of decompensation. Um, so we can probably say, you know, she probably most likely has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, playing the odds, but it could be something different. We can look and say, gosh, maybe she'd be a candidate for Plavix because she's got some left atrial enlargement. But if we really want to know what her heart disease is, we probably need to do an echo. Um, but again, playing the odds, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common acquired cardiomyopathy we find in a cat. So it could be reasonable if we didn't have access to an echo to do a BNP and a chest radiograph in this cat to try to decide where she is in the stage of her disease. However, this cat, we got a lot of information from um, these chest x-rays. So this cat came, this kitten came to us at three months of age with a loud heart murmur and whoa, a huge heart with a bump here in the main pulmonary artery and evidence of pulmonary overcirculation and maybe some heart failure. So this cat, this kitten is only three months of age and has, we can say, we don't, we don't necessarily know what it is, but we think it looks like a shunt, potentially, and prognosis is probably not great unless we identify something surgically fixable in this cat. So this would be a cat where getting a definitive diagnosis by echo would be helpful. So canine radiographs, here we have this little patient here. He's about 10 years old. Um, some sort of small mixed breed dog and we take some chest radiographs on him to look at the, uh, to try to investigate his left apical systolic murmur. And we can see that we've got some a degree of left atrial enlargement here. We can also see the left atrial enlargement uh, sitting between the main stem bronchi, but no evidence of congestive heart failure. So radiographs in this, in this dog may be pretty helpful. 
I think he, we could look at this dog and say he's a candidate maybe for pimobendin or an ACE inhibitor because we see significant uh, cardiomegaly, but he's not in congestive heart failure, so we might tailor our monitoring based on the x-rays. And we could do an echocardiogram for confirmatory um, purposes, but this gives us a lot of information. And here's another patient. This is a young Labrador where we're looking at um, investigating a right-sided murmur. He's only six months old. He comes in and um, he's uh, not growing great, but he's not terribly thin. Um, and we investigate his murmur by starting with some chest x-rays and we go, whoa, that is a huge heart. And we can see that the left ventricular apex is over here, so this is probably all right heart. This is all right heart here and we have a big vena cava. So right-sided murmur in a young Labrador with right-sided cardiomegaly has probably got tricuspid valve dysplasia playing the odds. So again, we got a lot of information from this. We need to do a little bit more with the ultrasound, but we, we gleaned a lot from just chest x-rays in our physical. And then lastly, um, for um, radiographs for heartworm disease. So I think they are quite useful for dogs with heartworm disease to know what you're dealing with and to help stage the patient. They may not influence what treatment we do um, because we may decide to go with the American Heartworm Society guidelines of the split dose protocol or it may, it may be a protocol according to the, the practice that you're in, but they can at least help you decide that gosh, this patient's uh, radiographs look pretty unexciting. Those are pretty normal. And this patient here has a big right caudal pulmonary artery and a main pulmonary art artery bulge and maybe some right heart enlargement. So I think that this patient might be at more risk for thromboembolic complications than the patient on the left side. So I think they can help us kind of know what degree of um, exercise restriction or steroid use or how we're going to manage that patient, what our expectations are if we have those radiographs. So I'm going to touch briefly on ECG because I think the ECG is not particularly useful as a screening diagnostic tool. We know it's not particularly sensitive for the detection of structural disease, although it is obviously the te diagnostic test of choice for arrhythmia detection. So we've got lots of um, choices to pick up on arrhythmias that we might hear on our auscultation. We can run a regular ECG. Um, I don't know if any of you have experience with the Alive Core monitors, but those are you know, a pretty inexpensive way to be doing ECG kind of out in the, in the field. We can send off for a Holter monitor and get a 24-hour reading. Um, or what, what happens commonly, I think, in, when I'm talking to um, referring veterinarians on the phone is they're taking an iPhone picture of their surgical screen as it goes by and sending it. And it sounds basic, but it works. <laughs> so I think that there's a wide variety of ways that we can capture an ECG to try to diagnose an arrhythmia if, it's, if our clinical suspicion is high. But if we're using it to screen for structural disease, it's not particularly good. But this is an example of where it might help us. So if we have two puppies, a shepherd here and some sort of terrier mix down here, and we, let's say we don't have access to other diagnostics, we run an ECG and we can see in this puppy that mean electrical axis looks pretty good because lead two is positive, as opposed to this puppy where, ooh, we've got really deep S waves. So these puppies both have the same left basal or systolic murmur, but I would be thinking that this dog probably had PS or some sort of variant because of the right heart enlargement pattern, and this dog could have SAS. So sometimes they, you know, if that's all you have to look at, it can certainly lead us one way or the other down, down one path. So when to refer, I think that kind of to summarize it up, um, depending on your availability for an ultrasound, there may be situations where we think that it's really, really strongly indicated, if at all possible, and that would be a really loud or a persistent murmur in a young animal. And the intent would be to try to identify something that we could surgically fix and give that patient a better prognosis, because the earlier we fix those things, the better. Um, or if you have significant heart disease supported by ancillary testing, for example, your radiographs, or if we have the presence or clinical signs of heart disease. So really what, what I think would be, you know, I think in any setting we want to identify the patients that have high manageability. So is there a PDA that we can fix and give that patient a good quality of life? Um, maybe there's only mild heart disease. Maybe, you know, sometimes the tiniest VSD causes the loudest murmur, but it doesn't affect their lifespan. Or maybe we just have a little bit of mitral valve degeneration or some mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So those patients might have a reasonably good uh, prognosis um, for a period of time, or maybe we fix them in for the rest of their life. And then we also want to see, you know, which patients, if they have heart disease, might have a good prognosis. So again, the PDA, the mild congenital heart disease, the mild heartworm disease maybe, or the mild HCM. 
where we, they might, with, with or without certain treatments, might do okay for, um, for a period of time. And that might affect um, their prognosis or adaptability. And then we're also hoping to identify those that might have an uncertain prognosis, either bad congenital heart disease or more advanced mitral valve disease or heartworm disease. So that's going to help guide us as far as our future um, prognostication and placement for that patient. I wanted to just touch briefly on bedside ultrasound because I don't know, does anyone have access to a, a bedside unit in their, in their setting where you could, yeah, so I think it's going to be more and more available. Um, in time, and, and these uh, little uh, less expensive ultrasound units are going to be available so that we can just stick the probe on. So you may have heard the terms TFAST or AFAST, um, and those are really for trauma, but we, use, we still use those terms. But a bedside ultrasound can give us a lot of information. So, oops, this was supposed to click, let's see. So we may look at this echo here and say, oh gosh, this, the left ventricle looks small and the right ventricle is super thick. So in a young patient, we'd be thinking, does this patient have tetralogy of flow or pulmonic stenosis? So it can guide us that way. Or we look at this one here, and this is that Labrador, where we've got a small left ventricle and a big, huge dilated right ventricle, so that fits more with tricuspid dysplasia. Or this particular one where we go, oh, so that big heart on radiographs was because of pericardial effusion, not because of congenital heart disease or something like that. Or in this cat that presents to us for respiratory distress, we can look and say, oh, the left atrium is maybe a little bit big, but it's really not that big, so I don't think the patient's in respiratory distress from heart failure. Guide us one way or the other. Or we can also, with um, some of the training courses that are out there, use the ultrasound to look for B lines, which indicate the presence of fluid that goes all the way to the surface of the chest wall and can help diagnose congestive heart failure as well. So I think these courses are going to become more available. Bedside ultrasound is going to be more available. And we can really use that as an extension of our physical exam and diagnostic tools. So during the time we have left, I'd like to go through a couple cases. Um, please chime in, uh, ask questions that you might have, um, and we can talk about anything else that I haven't touched on that you would like to talk about. But the first patient is Liberty, um, and she um, came and saw us because she had been found by a rescue at four weeks of age during Constitution Week. I felt pretty dumb because I had to go look up what Constitution Week was, but it's September 17th to 23rd. <laughs> And it's to celebrate the adoption of our Constitution. <laughs> so apparently these people are really into it. <laughs> but they named her Liberty, and the other ones got Constitution-related names too. But they noticed that she wasn't like the other three kittens. She was small, she had these episodes of respiratory distress, she, was, uh, she couldn't exercise, and she had poor growth, and she had a very loud heart murmur. So they brought her into us um, at about seven weeks of age, because they thought she was too small when they found her. And her echo showed that she had a PDA, very large PDA. So this tube that you see here is a patent ductus arteriosus. And normally it should narrow down a little bit, and hers really doesn't narrow. So it's just causing a massive amount of left to right uh, shunting um, across that PDA. She also has a ventricular septal defect. So this is the, the left ventricle here and the right ventricle here. And we can see turbulent flow going across a ventricular septal defect. So she's got two defects now. So we know we can fix the, VS, the PDA, but we can't fix the VSD. And so we've got some uncertainty about how to manage this patient where we really don't have a lot of funds. Maybe this VSD flow would be less if her heart was actually shrunk down from the PDA. So we ultimately did recommend that we go ahead and do surgery on her. These were her chest x-rays. I mean, her heart is just massively huge, and she's got pulmonary overcirculation, and she was in congestive heart failure at the time. So this little tiny thing that just got saddled with terrible heart disease um, congenitally. So these people set up a GoFundMe um, and raised um, a, a large portion of the funds. We were able to get some state funds, which we were lucky to have at North Carolina, to help match some of those. And we sent her home on Pimobend and Sildenafil for her pulmonary hypertension and heart Pimo and uh, furosemide to treat her heart failure. While they thought about things, they called us back. They said, we want to do it. We're raising money. So she went to surgery. She had a surgical PDA ligation. The surgeon said, oh my gosh, it was huge. Um, and this is what her PDA looked like at surgery. So this is the ductus itself, um, big, huge tube. And she did really well. So we saw her a month later. Um, at post-op, she had resolution of her volume overload. Her heart shrunk way down. Her pulmonary hypertension got better. 
and her VSD was there, but it looked like there was less flow through it, probably because her heart wasn't quite so dilated and stretched out. So she's still going to have that VSD her entire life, but um, she might be able to handle that okay, and she had clinical resolution of heart failure and her pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension is getting better. We haven't checked her again since. This was relatively recently, but we're hoping that she'll show further improvement as well. And that's her post-op. Um, we continued the sildenafil and managed to take her off heart failure medications, and she is looking for a home. If anyone wants to go down to North Carolina, she's um, still up on their, their GoFundMe page. But um, so here's a kitten where, you know, significant, yeah. And what age did you do the surgery? Um, eight weeks of age. <laughs> yes, it's very tiny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, so she's, we would say that we've identified partially um, manageable disease or partially repairable disease, but um, we thought that it was worth going forward because she probably had a good prognosis if we could get rid of the PDA and she was just left with the VSD. But we didn't know for sure, and we still don't entirely know for sure. So whoever takes her is going to have to be, um, you know, open to potentially long-term management with sildenafil, or although we're hoping to get her off that too, um, and potentially having rechecks. But um, she certainly would not have done as well as she had had she not had surgery. Yeah. They do, yeah. So you mean not, not this patient, not but yeah, patient. yeah. So VSD um, will typically have a really loud right-sided murmur. You may be able to hear it on the left, but the, the murmur is going to be loudest on the right. Okay. Yeah. And PDA up at the left base, and it's, you bring up an interesting point too, because the studies that have reported PDAs in cats, they don't all have continuous murmurs like dogs do. So, you know, they're cats. They can't do anything to make it easy. <laughs> but um, like 50 to 60 percent of them have continuous murmurs, and, some, and a large percent are reported to have systolic murmurs only. So it's probably a combination of cats' heart rates are really fast. It's hard to appreciate the continuous component to it, but they're not quite as easy to identify as dogs. And they're, it's not as common as dogs, but gosh, we've seen three in the last six months. So I don't know. Things come in waves. but. Yeah, so a loud continuous murmur at the left base, regardless of whether it's a dog or a cat, is probably 98% likely to be a PDA. There's other weird things that can do it, but um, you know, it, when it looks and smells like it, that's yeah. probably it. <laughs> yep. Any other questions on liberty or congenital heart disease in cats or puppies as we try to figure out what's, yeah. Yes, the question is, are all functional murmurs going to go away by four to five months? No. <laughs> so the puppy and kitten murmurs, they should resolve because the anemia of puppyhood resolves and the stroke volume normalizes. But we do see um, some functional or innocent murmurs that persist beyond. And those are the ones that we're going to need the echo to tell. Um, but like, for example, boxers, um, their aorta is just a little bit smaller relative to their body size than other breeds. And so they commonly have innocent or functional murmurs. So yeah, we do see them, um, or a really excitable dog, you know, that um, comes in and is bouncing off the walls. His um, stress level is high enough that he could produce a functional murmur. Can't let you do his heart anyway, so yeah, that's what right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you would expect that to go away. Yeah. 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 No, it's a good diagnostic tool. Good. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, what's causing these functional murmurs in cats that are really stressed? Um, and my own cat, I brought my own cat in um, during my residency for IBD workup, and the medicine resident came and found me and said, your cat's got a grade three murmur. I was like, no, he doesn't. <laughs> so it happens a lot. But so the cat's heart is, um, you know, smaller than our fist, and the right ventricle curves around it. And so when they get stressed and they have a lot of catecholamine stimulation, that right heart kind of squishes down on the, the curvature of the septum, and there's not much, much space there. And sometimes we catch this on echo, so that's how we know it's happening, but it creates turbulence in that right ventricle, and that's where the dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction term comes from. There's no structural thing, it's just simply the right heart con uh, contracting down on the left. And when that cat's heart rate goes down, or it gets a sedative, or it's less stressed, or the next person listen to it, listens to it and it's less stressed, then the murmur can go away. So that's probably what's happening in the majority of those cases. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. My take on anesthesia for patients with heart disease is that 
most of the time it's using good monitoring and low doses of your drugs is most important as opposed to choosing a specific protocol. So in that case, if you say, gosh, I got this cat with a murmur, I don't know if he's got really bad HCM or he's got a functional murmur and, and nothing. So if I take the approach that maybe I avoid ketamine or at least go really low dose ketamine or use an opioid, um, I've tried to avoid ACE or at least use a low dose of ACE, I monitor the rhythm really closely, I'm cautious with fluid therapy, um, and we typically go around three to five mils per kilo per hour when we don't know what we're dealing with. Um, if you do all those things um, and you're conservative in your doses, I think most of the time you don't have a problem with these patients. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think and one of the big things that we try to avoid is the like dexmedetomidine type drugs, um, the alpha 2s, because those are really cardiovascularly depressant. So we avoid them even if we have mild um, heart disease, because I think they can, if you do an echo on one of those patients, you realize that their function is just terrible. So, so we avoid those drugs, and we try to avoid excessive tachycardia. So we might actually not pre-med with atropine or glyco unless it's necessary. Um, and we use a lot of opioids and low-dose ACE um, and try to, l to use low-dose inhalants. And I think if you are basically just conservative and you ramp up your monitoring, there's, there, you can get away with anesthetizing patients with heart disease a lot of times without problems. Um, I'm happy to chat to anyone uh, specifically if you want to talk about that, but I think it is our time to, to end, so thanks.